Good morning, River Church. How are you guys doing today? Uh, hopefully you're doing well. Uh, if you look behind me, you may notice something different. It's actually, I am in our nursery right now. Uh, our main space is being transformed uh, for a wedding, and so it's all decked out. It looks really nice, uh, but I won't be able to record over there, so I'm recording in our in our nursery so the baby blue uh, if it if it bugs you just close your eyes and listen to the sermon um, but I'm excited and I'm happy to be here with you guys um, many of you know that I just left my job at uh, Pace High School and I'm gonna now come to work at River but when I was at Pace I um, I was a football coach and many of y'all know that but what most people don't know is I also taught a class. I was in uh, the classroom. And so my, the class that I taught was professional communications. Now, uh, this class was uh, the, what the kids use to get their speech credit. And so it's the class that every single kid has to take. Now, it's not necessarily a speech class, but the, cla the name of the class is professional communications. And so I was a professional communications teacher. And... Um, and what it was is it was a class that was designed to get students to uh, be able to speak in a professional setting. So it wasn't necessarily public speaking the whole time, but it was uh, getting getting kids, people used to being able to communicate, uh, like I said, in a professional environment. So what that meant was they had to be able to um, know the history of communication, know where it came from, kind of know how it started and where it's at today. Uh, we did a lot of stuff on grammar, making sure our, our words were spelled correctly, our sentences were constructed correctly, uh, things of that nature. We progressed to uh, writing letters and emails and memos. Again, this is professional communication, communicating in the professional uh, work <clears throat> work environment. Uh, we, we progressed, we ended the class with doing uh, interviews and career readiness type stuff. So we wanted the kids to be able to, you know, create a resume and, and communicate with uh, future employers uh, in that way. And so it was a really cool class, really interesting class. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do for the class, um, I would, what I thought would be beneficial because it's a career readiness career prep class uh, one of the things that i wanted to do i thought would be beneficial for my students is if i recorded career professionals and uh, did an interview with them and talked to them about their jobs and what they were like as kids and and how they ended up in their profession that they're in and all those sorts of things like i, I would talk to them about that and and i thought it'd be interesting for my students to watch those videos and and, and try and relate to these people and 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 and, and see if maybe they were interested in these certain types of careers. And so it was really cool. I got to, and, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to, lo, uh, I wanted to interview local people. And so I interviewed a local firefighter. I interviewed a, um, <clears throat> a nurse. I interviewed a graphic designer. I interviewed a buddy of mine who is a, an engineer. He graduated as an engineer and he works in Houston. He owns his own construction company. And so I, I interviewed all these professionals and I wanted my kids to see these real people in their profession. And so I started doing this, it was really cool. I would do it on Fridays. It was our, our Friday uh, career day. And the administration at my high school, they loved it. Uh, one of the teachers, I'm um, sorry, one of the, the principals, the assistant principals, she really liked it. She thought it was fantastic. And so um, <laughs> with that, uh, she's like, Billy, you need to interview this person. I have a person that I just met and she would love to give back to the students and she wants to uh, be interviewed by you. So set that up and, and make it happen and, and, and let me know when you're done. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, and so she tells me this like in January, right? Um, so a few weeks went by and again, it was January. We're getting back from the break. Uh, I'm in the beginning of track season at this point, and so we're practicing and kids and all that stuff. And so I'm like, okay, I need to call her, I need to call her, I need to call her, I need to call her. Uh, but I just never actually made the time to call her. So a few weeks go by, and I don't call <laughs> this 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 doctor. And so um, I was like, man, I need to call her. 
while this is happening uh, or during this time, the principal comes up to me and says, hey, Billy, have you, have you made contact with that person yet? Have you set up your interview? And I said, there is no progress that has been made. And she's like, what? <laughs> I was like, oh, man. She's like, make sure you get it done. I said, like, okay, yes, ma'am, you're right. I need to get it done. I'm sorry I haven't done it. So I assure her it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. It's going to look fantastic. And... Um, Yeah, busyness ensues after that. Um, I get, you know, again, busy with trek. Now we get into the thick of the season, and we're getting our kids ready and faster and stronger and getting them prepared for our district track meet. And I still hadn't contacted this doctor. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's been like two months already. And I told this, this the, the, the principal, the assistant principal, like two, like a month and a half ago that I was going to get it taken care of. And it's already been... We're already going into, uh, I'm sorry, we're already coming out of spring break. So it was towards the end of March and I still hadn't made contact with her. And so, man, I was like, I did not, you know, I like to see people at work and I was real happy and, and talking to uh, the different, my coworkers and stuff. And, you know, I've always respectful to uh, my administration, but I was doing everything I could <laughs> to avoid this specific assistant principal. And again, she was lovely, she was sweet, she was nice. It was just me. Like I knew that once I, I, I talked to her that I was gonna be, uh, it was not gonna go well for me. So what I did was I tried to, like I said, I tried to avoid her. So my classroom uh, was near the front office. So where all the administration like houses during the, like their offices are. My, my, my classroom was close to that. And so when it was time to leave or I was going to lunch or even going to the restroom, like I would stand by my door and I would listen and try and see because she had a pretty, um, I wouldn't say loud voice, but a very um, noticeable voice, right? And so I'd, I would listen for her distinct voice. And if I couldn't hear it, then, then I would sneak out to the bathroom or I'd, 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 I'd quickly rush around the corner to the, the teacher's parking lot, right? I was doing whatever I could to avoid this lady. And, and if I was in the middle of my escape or in my plan to maybe get to the parking lot and I heard her voice, I would quickly turn into the copy room or quickly go to the bathroom or, or do something or turn around and go back to my room, but I would do whatever I could to avoid her. I was dodging her. <clears throat> at the end of the day, though, good news, at the end of the day, you know, she, we eventually, uh, she called me, she just called me, right? I didn't have to like sneak around and do that stuff. She just called me like, hey, <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, I got it done. It was awesome. The doctor was a sweet lady. Um, and uh, it was good. Everything was fine. But I remember during that time, like I was, as I said, going through lengths to avoid uh, this person. Now, my question for you guys is, what lengths have you gone to to avoid somebody? Today, we're going to look at the story of Jonah. Okay, and Jonah had a very specific assignment from God and he was avoiding this specific assignment the question is why why was he avoiding this what was preventing Jonah from doing what God had called him to do and 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 as we study that part of Jonah and, and trying to figure out you know not just him avoiding God but why he avoided God why he was like ducking him trying to escape him as we, as, we, as we study about Jonah and why he did that, I want us also to think of our own lives. And that's how it's going to transfer into how, how do we have a hard time doing what Christ has called us to do. Now again, in, in answering this question, we're going to be in the book of Jonah. We're going to take a break from our Great Exchange series. Um, we're going to be in the book of Jonah and... Last time I preached, I gave us a, a one-time sermon on the on a passage in Mark. Um, over the course of my uh, preaching assignments going forward, I want us to uh, go through the book of Jonah. So it's not just going to be a one-time service or one-time sermon, I'm sorry, but we're going to go through the book over a period of time. So, But again, we're going to step away from the Great Exchange and we're going to be looking... In uh, at the book of Jonah. Okay, now 
to start, Jonah is an interesting book, and I want to ask you guys a question. What what is the first word that you think of when you hear the name Jonah or the book of Jonah? What's the first word that comes to your mind? If you're like most people, if you're like my son, if you're like my wife, if you're like anybody, <laughs> one of the first words that you think of when you think of the story of Jonah is a whale. You think about a whale or a really large fish eating Jonah, right? And there was actually a story about this in the news. I, I haven't read it yet, <laughs> but uh, someone said he was eaten by a whale and he was like on his hospital bed or something like that. But but that's what we think of. We think of that story, right? If, if, if any of y'all are Jordan Peterson fans, which I think that guy's really intelligent. Um, but he takes this, 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 this story of a whale and he associates it with the story of Pinocchio. And it's this really extra- extravagant psychological uh, uh, tale that has all these implications in our lives. And, um, <clears throat> and these are all interesting, interesting stories. But, and as our title uh, of our sermon series explains, uh, expresses is, is that this story is so much more than the story of a whale, right? It is not a, about the whale. Okay, that's just part of the story, and I hope we, we learn this as we go through. Uh, but just to highlight this, right? <clears throat> uh, the fish in this in the story of Jonah, the fish is only mentioned three times. Okay, Jonah is mentioned. The name Jonah is mentioned 18 times, and the Lord's name, or God, is referred to 41 times. Now, it's it's important to note that there is a big fish in this story, but the story isn't about the fish. The story is about God. And I hope we don't miss that as we go through this story. Now, Jonah... uh, no, 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 let me give you a little bit of back... A backstory, a little bit of history about Jonah as we move forward into today's passage. So Jonah was a prophet, right? And, and a prophet's authority came from God, right? You usually heard prophets saying something. They, they would have to go towards people uh, and they would usually say, thus saith the Lord, right? The Lord says. Now the prophets had a specific role. Right, their their role was to speak the words, lords to the uh, the, the I'm sorry, the Lord's words to the Israelites. So they received a word from the Lord, right? That was their that was their authority. Their authority was the Lord's voice, right? The priests, their authority was the Scripture, and they were charged with going around and making sure that people followed the Scriptures and followed the laws and and all of those sorts of things. Priests. Prophets, which Jonah was, is he received his authority, his words from God, and his audience was the usually the Israelites. Okay, a lot of people didn't like prophets because if a prophet was coming to talk to you, he was usually telling you that your life was not right, <laughs> and uh, and that you needed to turn from your evil ways. Uh, but but that's what Jonah's that's what Jonah's job was. He he was a prophet. Okay, he usually had to he had to as I said he he would he would usually announce the, the Lord's judgment upon a people and, and and usually it was the Israelites. Now Jonah served in the kingdom of Israel, uh, uh, and 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 more specifically, this was after, at the time of the time period when the the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, was split into two. It was after King Solomon, it was split into two, and there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom right the northern kingdom in these passages not all of the bible but it's usually referred to as as the the nation of israel and then the southern uh the southern uh kingdom is referred to as the 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 nation of judah or the tribe of judah right um and so anyway uh, so he was part of the northern kingdom 
And this was a larger, more prosperous kingdom. They had most of the, uh, of the tribes of Israel were associated with the northern kingdom, right? And so this was a large, bustling kingdom. And, and around the time that, that Jonah was serving, this was actually uh, um, probably one of the more uh, successful, more fruitful time periods that the, the nation of Israel had. Uh, since the time of King Solomon. So it was a very bustling, very successful time. <clears throat> and, uh, and so he was serving in during this time period. And, and I just want to, 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 to make note of the land, the, the area. So the, the, the area where the, the land that the Israelites inhabited was, as you've seen from the map, as you know where Israel is, um, it was in the middle. It was a highly coveted land, right? There, it was. It was next to the 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 the, the, the sea, the ocean. Uh, it was. It was a. It was a very beautiful, uh, fruitful uh, agricultural type land. Uh, you could do a lot. So it was highly coveted land, and all of these, uh, all of these nations around it always fought to try and overtake this space, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, with this caused the Israelites to have a lot of enemies. And amongst their enemies to the northeast were the Assyrians. The Assyrians. So uh, with that, let's jump into our passage. And remember, we're trying to answer the question, why do we have a hard time doing what Christ has called us to? Uh, to do. And our main point, our first main point is um, why do we have a hard time doing what Christ has called us to do? We ignore the Lord's words. And with that, let's read Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, uh, saying, <clears throat> Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, right? It was like the biggest or the most popular, populated city in, in, in Assyria, right? <clears throat> and call, out against, uh, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me, but but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Verse four. Uh, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners uh, were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They were, uh, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Right? It was too heavy. Like, man, this is getting crazy. Let's start throwing stuff overboard so we all don't, <laughs> so we all don't die. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so uh, they, they hurled cargo that was in the ship uh, to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came down and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may perish. So at this point, the mariners, the people of the boat, they don't know what's going on. These are not Hebrew people. They are not uh, followers of the creator of all things, right? Almighty God. They're not followers of him. They practice their own types of religion. And they're at this point, they are desperate. They're looking for answers and they're crying out to any God. They're whoever, whatever they think to know to do. That's what they're doing. And Jonah the follower of the one true God is asleep. And, and the captain's like, hey, what are you doing? Like, he doesn't even know who he is. He's just like, nobody should be chilling right now. You need to be doing some work. You need to be praying. You need to try and get us out of this situation. <clears throat> 
But the interesting thing to, 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 to look at this passage is, is God told Jonah, he said, Arise, go to Nineveh and call them to repentance. Right? Go this way, call them to repentance. What we see Jonah doing is Jonah rose and instead of going this way, he went this way. He went in the complete opposite direction. Jonah doesn't say, you know what, Lord, I'm not feeling that. He just bolts, right? He just ignores the situation. <clears throat> it's almost as if he's pretending uh, not to hear, right? It reminds me of that Homer Simpson gift. Some of y'all may be familiar with this, where he comes out of the bushes, right? And it's like, Jonah, go do this. Uh, go talk to the Ninevites. And he just pretends not to hear and he fades back into the bushes, right? That is what the picture that I'm seeing here. Right? He, the Lord tells him to do something, and he literally just disappears and does the opposite. It's actually disturbing when you look at the map of, of the area of, of where the Lord tells him to go and where he actually goes. Right? <clears throat> Um, and so if you look at the map, and, and, and we don't have the map right now, but, but think of it this way. It'd be like if I told you guys, okay, guys, we're going to travel. Uh, we're going to go to, the Lord is calling us to go to Mexico City, right? It's about, about a 10-hour drive south from here. And we're like, and, and when we go there, we're, we're going to share the gospel with these people. It's going to be great whatever uh that's where we're going and instead of going there we're like you know what i don't want to go this way in fact i'm going to go to seattle washington on the opposite side of the country and it would actually be a little bit further than that and so and, and again this is before airplanes right so it's not like i'm just hopping a plane i'll be there in a few hours like there was days and and weeks of and maybe even months of travel before you reached these different locations. Now that that although that is very interesting, it's something to take to, to take that is something to take note of. I will say uh, that it is not there, there's a little bit more to that. Okay, and, and and what I mean by that is Jonah went to Tarshish. Okay, now again, if you look at the map, if you look at the location, this was the furthest west that you could travel. It was, it was the known world, right? The Americas were not discovered yet. The known world, that was as far as you could go to avoid doing what the Lord has called you to do. You didn't just like, you didn't just go to Seattle. You went to the edge of the earth. That's how much he was trying to avoid the call of God. He went to the edge of known civilization. He did not want to do this. It would be like us. If, if we were to be uh, you know, given a task, the Lord calls us like, hey, you need to go share this, uh, the gospel with this group of people. And you're like, you know what? I don't like those people. I don't want to go to those people. I'm going to go down, drive down Boca Chica, go visit Elon Musk at SpaceX, hop in a rocket, and fly to Mars. Like that is how desperate Jonah was to escape doing what the Lord had called him to do. Now, we might never physically uh, go to such lengths to avoid somebody, right? You, you may not be like me and, and sneaking through the hallway at school, or, or you may not, like, like Jonah, drive across the country to get away from somebody, right? You may not physically do this, but we do it mentally. We avoid situations that the Lord has called us to. We pretend that we don't here. We know we need to do something. We know we need to, uh, you know, talk to my wife, reconcile that relationship. I need to love my kids well. I need to do certain things that the Lord has called me to do, but I'm just like pretending that I don't know these things. I'm pretending like everything is okay. We ignore the Lord's words. 
The problem is we can't ignore the Lord's words. Oh man, <laughs> we, we just can't ignore the Lord's words. Right? In our family, we love mugs, uh, you know, coffee mugs. We love coffee mugs. Um, we aren't crazy about it or anything. We don't buy a coffee mug every time we go somewhere. Uh, but we do like to collect coffee mugs. We also like to collect uh, Christmas ornaments, and it's very similar. But, but usually when we travel, right, we'll, 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 so for instance, our honeymoon, we went to uh, Angel Fire, New Mexico, and uh, we bought some Angel Fire mugs. And so now when we have coffee, we drink uh, from these Angel Fire, Fire mugs, and it reminds us of you know, our honeymoon, right? Or uh, we have one of the Grand Canyon, we have one of Chicago. Um, but it's not just locations. If there's something that's very inspirational or that signifies a moment in our life, we'll also buy a, buy a mug for that occasion as well. For example, when William was born, me and my wife, uh, or when, not when he was born, but when we found out that Lisi was pregnant. We were about to go to the doctor. Uh, we bought a Dunkin' Donuts uh, mug and we had coffee just before, together, just before we went to go get our ultrasound. And so we bought that coffee mug. There was a coffee mug in our house that reminds us of the time when Lisa and I became parents. It's such a sweet little uh, gesture. It's so cool. Um, but we also try to get stuff that has some sort of inspirational or thought-provoking uh, message on it. So we have one that's, uh, you know, it says motivation in a mug, or, um, which that's not that in inspirational. We have one that says be curious, right? And so uh, it just challenges us to think like, okay, how can I be curious about certain things? And so we, we buy these mugs and we have them for various, uh, just various collection of mugs around our house. And so um, one time, Lisa and I were in a disagreement. <laughs> I laugh now because I'm still alive, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, we were in a disagreement, and I don't remember what the details of the disagreement. It's funny how that is, right? Like, you're always, like, fighting with your spouse, or maybe not always fighting, but you do fight. And then, like, it's, like, the biggest deal. And then later on, you, like hey, what were we fighting? I don't even remember, right? And so I don't remember what we were arguing about, but I do remember that I wasn't being completely truthful with her about something, right? And I didn't necessarily lie, but I was avoiding having to tell my wife the truth about something. Like I was just like avoiding that question. Uh, I know it's something that I needed to address, but I was just like, okay, well, technically she hasn't asked me yet, so I'm not going to say anything, but I know that I needed to tell her something. And again, I don't remember what it was. Uh, but it was it was funny. And, and we're talking about ignoring the Lord's word. And so one morning we're at the breakfast table. We're having coffee together. And she picks up her mug. And she has no idea. She's just drinking her coffee. And I look at her mug. And on the mug are two words. Be honest. <laughs> And I was like, okay, all right, I guess I'm going to have to do this. Uh, and I didn't want to, right? I didn't want to do this, but it was the Lord convicting me. Be honest. You need to tell your wife what you need to tell her. <sighs> so I did. Again, I'm still alive, guys. We're good. Um, but we can't ignore the Lord. We can't run from Him. The Lord, and it's super crazy and weird, and you may think that it's such a coincidence, but the Lord speaks through these different ways, right? He speaks to us reminds us of His truth through that mug. Be honest, right? He, he reminds us of something that's on our mind when a random person comes up to us and starts telling us a story that we were just thinking about, right? It's it, it, it the the Lord may show up in a dream and tell you something. Okay, now now the Lord works in these ways. Now I'm not saying go like look at every sign. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? But the Lord has a way of communicating with you. 
We can't ignore his words. <clears throat> now, we just talked about us not being able to ignore his words. Good. But the question now becomes is why do we ignore the Lord's words? What what is it about us that we ignore his words and this leads us to our second main point and and it is that the lord isn't that important to us right we ignore his words because he's not that important to us jonah 7 uh, john chapter 1 verses 7 through 10 we're moving on in the passage it says and they said to one another come let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come of uh, come upon us and so casting lots uh Means that they were um, they were like almost like drawing straws, okay? It wasn't. It, it was just a way to uh, determine who uh, did something, right? Um, not overly scientific, but that's how they used things back then. To kind of be like similar to like drawing straws or like maybe like rolling die to see, uh, you know, who who. Um, uh, who is, is, is through the, the rolling of the die, through the casting of lots, who is the person that they need to target, right? Um, and so they did this. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where did you come from? And what is your country? And of what people are you? Verse 9, And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Dry land. Verse 10, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why is this that... Uh, I'm sorry, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence uh, of the Lord because he, Jonah, had told them. So again, the main point is that the Lord is not that important to us. And I have a question for us as, as we begin to explain this passage, is what do we prioritize above God? What do we prioritize over God? I've taught at school for the past nine years, right? At Pace High School for the past nine years. And then every year at the beginning of the year, we do this icebreaker activity where it's, we go around the room and, and tell us, uh, you know, tell us uh, your name and what grade you're in and Tell us something interesting about yourself, right? <clears throat> uh, most people don't like to do this activity. They think it's really weird, really awkward. Like, just please, especially teenagers, right? Please just talk to someone else. Avoid me. Skip me, right? Uh, but, and, and I, I don't blame them. Like, I, I can be the same way too. But the ones who are actually interested in this question, uh, who like to answer this question, uh, they, they, they put a lot of thought into their answer, right? They'll observe the room, they'll look around, they will listen to and pay attention to other people's responses, and they'll try and formulate, based on what everybody else is saying, they'll formulate something that makes them distinct amongst everybody else. They'll say something that usually sets them apart from other people. <clears throat> they want to be distinguished from the, the group. They don't want to be like anyone else. They want to stand out. And so Jonah is asked this question, and his response is telling. And let's look at this exchange. It reads in verse 8, it says, Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where are you from? What's your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. Right? I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. Okay? Now, what is the most distinguishing response that Jonah could think of? Is that he says, I am a Hebrew. Right? I am part of God's chosen people. Jonah loves his status as a Hebrew more than he loves to be identified as someone who fears God. Right? He, isn't, he isn't a reluctant prophet, which many of us may think of Jonah. Jonah was sent to go and be a prophet and go uh, be a messenger of the words of the Lord, and he was just reluctant. Yes, he was, but he wasn't always like that. 
right? And, and we first meet uh, Jonah in in Second Kings, and here Jonah has to prophesy to the nation of Israel, right? They are doing completely wicked things, uh, even though they are in a prosperous time, they're doing wicked things, and Jonah has to speak out against the Israelites. Doesn't have a problem doing that, right? But when the Lord says, go to these other people, go to the Ninevites, your enemies, who are also doing evil things in front of the Lord, right? Jonah has a problem with doing that thing, right? He doesn't have a problem being a prophet. He has a problem being a prophet to those people. He doesn't, he doesn't want them to receive God's gracious blessings, God's forgiveness, God's love. He doesn't want that for them. He wants that for His people, but not those people. So my question to us is, who are those people in our lives? Right? Maybe you are a high, most... Uh, maybe your most significant identification is that you're an American. And so to you, those people would be anybody else, people of other countries, maybe illegals, right? Or the refugees, right? Let me share Jesus with my American people, but not though, like we got enough problems here. Why are we going to, why are we going to worry about other nations, other people, right? Maybe your highest identity is your political party, <laughs> Those people, to you, would be the people on the other side of the political aisle, right? The Republicans, the conservatives would think, man, everything would be so much better if the liberals would just, like, go back home and chill out, right? And then the liberals would think, man, everything would be so much better if the conservatives would just be a little bit more open-minded and less less um, constricting, right? And so the, those people to, to those is the other side of the political aisle, right? Maybe, you're, uh, maybe your highest identity is your wealth or your so- social status, right? And, 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 and we see with that that the, 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 those people are anyone who doesn't live up to that standard, Through this, we start to see why Jonah is running from God. God is not the most important thing in his life. The ironic thing, the crazy thing, there's a lot of irony in this passage, but the ironic thing about this passage is that Jonah knows better. He knows better. Okay, Um, His theology is on point. His words are on point. He knows God, and he knows his relationship with God towards him, yet he doesn't act like it, right? If James were observing his life, he would say that his faith is dead because he doesn't have the works to match his faith, right? And you see this, you see this in his answer, right? You see that he says, he says, uh, I'm a Hebrew, and then he, and then this is how he describes the Lord. He says, "I fear the Lord." Good, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, I fear the Lord, uh, the God of heaven, right? The, who made the sea and the dry land, so the Creator of everything. What we are on right now, this ocean, and where He came from, this dry land, everything. This is the God that I fear, right? He knows what he's supposed to say, but yet his life doesn't reflect it. It sounds just like Jesus' quote when he quotes uh, Isaiah about the Pharisees. He says, you honor me with your, your lips, but your heart is far from me. He knows what to say, but obviously from Scripture, he is not doing that specific thing. How many of us fit into that category, right? <clears throat> How many of us know our Bible well? How many, how many of us could explain, you know, a substitutionary atonement or justification or sanctification, or we could walk through the ordinances and, and, and discuss the proper mode of baptism, but we have a hard time following the Lord, Let's let's broaden it a bit. Let's 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 pull back just a little bit. 
We may, we may not be able to explain those things well. Uh, we, our theology may not be up to that point yet. But how many of us know that Christ calls us to love our neighbors? How many of us know that Christ calls us to love our enemies? Even broader, how many of us know that Christ calls us to love our spouse or to be a good father or to be a good employee or to be a good student? But we refuse to do those things. We prioritize other things above what Christ has called us to. How many of us pay lip service to God, but our hearts are far from Him? <clears throat> and it sounds pretty grim right now, guys, and I understand, but let, let's move on to this next passage, because there is hope. Let's look at this passage. Uh, uh, Jonah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. It says, Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Verse 14, Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. It's crazy. Again, people who don't have a relationship with God are calling out to God, doing the things that Jonah should be doing. Verse 15, So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Verse 16, then the, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Last verse, verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And as I said uh, before, guys, there is hope. There is hope. And so you may be thinking, what is the hope? <laughs> That a big fish will eat me? <laughs> That'll take me out of my misery? Right? Well, I am going to the beach this weekend, so maybe uh, if I play my cards right, <clears throat> that's not the hope. But before we get to the hope, let's examine the text. So we just read, everyone is tripping out and they are panicking because the conditions are getting worse. It's not like they can just pull over Right and, 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 and wait for the storm to pass and pull over on the side of the road, but they have to sit through it. They have to figure things out. <clears throat> They're throwing cargo overboard. The ship is uh, bending, and it's close to just being torn apart, and they are crying out to the Lord to save their lives. And so Jonah, seeing all of this, he realizes that it is his fault there in the situation. He recognizes that he is running from the Lord and it is his rebellion that has put them all in danger. Like any noble man, he decides to sacrifice himself so that everyone may live. Right? He, volu uh, he volunteers to be cast overboard, so they throw him overboard. The storm settles. Jonah saves the day. What a noble man Jonah is. Let's be like Jonah, right? <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. That is not right. Jonah hates the Ninevites. In this passage, we see that he would rather die, rather be thrown overboard to his death, than to do what the Lord has called him to do. In this passage, it seems as though Jonah's uh, uh, options are that he either, either he dies or everybody dies. But there is another option. And that option is for us to repent, to turn back to the Lord. Main point number three, we need to return to the Lord. We have seen uh, why we have a hard time doing a crisis called us to do, right? We don't, 
we avoid God. We don't put him in his proper place in our lives. And, and what happens as a result of this? We run from him. We run from his presence. We avoid him. What should we do about it? Turn back. Turn around. Repent. Return to the Lord. Return to Him. You do not have to run and hide. We saw in the story today that you can't do that anyway. Joel, another prophet, in Joel 2.13, he says, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Guys, Jesus died for us. In this rebellion, in this separation, in this, in this wanting to remove ourselves from God and run from God and, and, <clears throat> and escape Him, Right, and, and when you do this to a parent or a friend, like that friend doesn't want you back, but 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 God says, "Come back to me. I am patient. I am gracious. I am merciful. I am slow to anger. I am abounding in steadfast love. Come to me." Jesus died for our sins, so we can return to Jesus. We don't have to run. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. We do not have to run. Today we have learned that Jonah was avoiding the Lord. Lord, We learned that he hates the Ninevites and doesn't want to share the gospel with them. We learned that he would rather die than do what the Lord has commanded him to do. All right, we talked about return to the Lord. That's the big, that's the hope right there. Our hope is Jesus. Our hope is what He has done. Our hope is that we are able to actually do that. So I'd encourage us to do that. Now, you may be thinking, well, how do I do that, Billy? Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, do I need to start um, coming to church every Sunday? Do I need to be a part of a gospel community? Like, what is it that I need to do to return to the Lord? And this is our application point, guys. Is just pray to Him. Seek Him in prayer. There's, there's many things and there, there's, there's a lot of action that we could take. And there's a lot of good things that we could do. But we're not there right now, guys. Today, right now, this week, if we've been wandering from the Lord, just return to Him in prayer. That's it. Pray every day. On your way to work. When you get home, sit in the parking, sit in your driveway for a few minutes. Maybe you get to work a little bit early. Maybe you wake up before everybody else. Spend time with the Lord. The Lord loves you. I want us to be, you know, good spouses. I want us to be good husbands, good fathers, right? Good workers. But this week, I want us to focus on just praying to God. Return to the Lord, your God, for He is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank You for uh, Your Word, Lord. We thank You for uh, this time together. Lord, I just pray that we return to You in prayer. Uh, those of us who are wondering, those of us who are straying from the Lord, uh, straying from you, Lord, I pray that we just return to you. We, we don't necessarily need to come back with, with all these presents and all these gifts and all these things to come back to you. We just, just come back to you in prayer, Lord. Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we love you. Lord, forgive us. Lord, thank you. I pray that, that it be us this week, Lord. Praise in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, River Church. It's been fun. I am looking forward to um, seeing you guys soon. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm coming on staff here at River Church, and I'm really excited about that. And I'm just eager to serve you guys in that way. And you know, hopefully, hopefully, you will. <laughs> um, 
the ways in which I which I serve you guys um, hopefully it's just beneficial for everybody so anyway it's besides the point I love you guys and I am looking forward uh, to seeing you guys soon